Yeah. Welcome to Senate Education Wednesday, February 8th, 1.30. Uh, before we go to Jody Emerson, who is going to join us, I just want to make sure everyone received the press releases that were brought to you. Uh, and so this is, uh, these were hoaxes at this point, hoax calls uh, to provide, to provoke anxiety and fears in our schools and communities. Uh, I have asked the Agency of Education to come in and give us a briefing on it, give us a bit of an update. The agency cannot come in to talk about what we were going to have them talk about since it's understandably all hands on deck upstairs right now. But what they will come in and talk to us about at 2.30 is Ted Fisher will provide an update um, on the situation. And just so everyone knows, I do have a list here that I will read of the schools that were threatened, just so you know, Albert Community Education Center, Arlington Memorial High School, Brattleboro High School, Christ the King High School, Colchester High School, Enosburg High School, Essex High School, Fairhaven High School, Grace Christian School, Middlebury Union High School, Milton <coughs> High School, Sisquoi Valley Union High School, Montpelier High School, Newport City Elementary School, North Country Union High School, North Country Union Junior High School, Otter Valley Union High School, Randolph Union High School, Rice Memorial High School, St. Albans City Elementary School, and United Christian Academy. So those are the schools that received. Is it Miss Porter? That's right. What's that? Miss Porter. Miss Porter? No, Porter. Oh, yeah, no, yeah, yeah. So that's. That's a coordinated effort. That's a lot of schools to. Yeah, handle. it's interesting, right? And so I, I don't know if you want to say anything or correct me if I'm wrong. And my understanding is it sounds like it was some kind of almost robocall to all of these different mm -hmm. institutions. Uh, but it wasn't the institutions that I don't think picked up. I think they went directly to local police. Yeah. And then in one case, it went to the town clerk's office. The governor made a press release on it. I think it was VOIP uh, form system. Okay. So, yeah. So, Mr. Fisher will be in to update us. Uh, the governor held a press conference uh, front and center, of course, everybody's safety, and then also talking how do you talk to kids about this, and then how do kids deal with this kind of trauma when it happens to them on a day like this where, you know, there's something you know police cars arrive all these you know ambulances are there the feeling in the school and how best to deal with that so ted will be in to talk to us about that any immediate questions while we have the agency of education in here right now okay okay ms emerson hey jody how you feeling not great today thank you though thanks for having me well, we appreciate you joining us. Uh, just to recap for everyone, what we had asked you to do was tell us, I think basically what can we, nice cat, uh, what can we basically do to help the CTEs in the state? Uh, I think that was basically the charge or was it a little bit different? Um, I was there uh, two was weeks, there ago, two weeks and ago and talking and about, talking about um, sort of workforce, sort of workforce development, development and you had a couple of the, of the adult ed adult CTE, CTE folks here or there, there as well. Um, um, and you asked, and us, you to asked us to come to together come and together come up with a list of actionable items. items. And so and we so did that. We, did um, that. we met last we met last. I guess late that week. And I sent it last week. Yeah, and we have it right here. Great. In our packet, it says Great. funding, Great. access, adult tech ed, and AOE staffing. So if you would take us through this, that would be terrific. Yeah, so some of what um, we've been talking about and it's been part of the study that the Joint Fiscal Offices has um, put forward that APA Consulting is doing out of Colorado. And their report, I think, is going to be delayed, but we're hopeful that they'll have something in March or April that talks about a funding model for CTE that's non-competitive 
right now there's there's a perceived disincentive to send students to CTE. Obviously, I'm not seeing the impacts of that because I have so many folks trying to get in and not enough space for them. But there are times when we compete with our sending schools instead of collaborating with and a, a new funding model would help we think would help that and a while ago there was a pilot that was ready to go out three years ago so right before covid um and that model was not going to pit schools against each other and it didn't end up being piloted because of covid and, and everything that happened then so we're, we're hoping that we get back to something and that something comes out of that work. And I know the House Education Committee has been talking about it too. So just to be clear, if we were to then return to the pilot that was never piloted uh, and try this, uh, that sounds like it's, it's, it's a decent first step. Put some money aside, again, like you're saying, so we're not here, people aren't competing against one another. And we can have Beth St. Right. James dig up some of that language and see if we see if we can get our colleagues to agree to give it a shot yeah i think the work was done um and over yeah. along if you saw that um, white paper from the cte directors there were years and years worth of work done around funding and that was the the pilot model that was proposed out of that and moving that forward might show us whether that would work it might be prudent to see what comes out of the um the research that's being done by APA and see if it still fits that model or if there's something bigger that needs to happen with school funding. Either or, just making sure that there's something that helps us to move forward um, with, our, with our programming and not be fighting against schools across the state so that students get what they need. I mean, ultimately it's making sure we do what's best for students. Yeah, no, this is, but, this is a good change. Yeah, and the next piece on there was the. Uh, oh, sorry. Sorry. Um, just a quick question. I'm, I'm looking at the point on the back regarding staffing in the AOE, and and I apologize if you were going to get to this, but um, you know, I'm curious: is it that there are positions and they're not being filled, or the positions don't exist and that that needs to be expanded? Do you know which one? Um, so. I am still new to CTE. This is my second year. And my understanding was that there used to be more staffing and that staffing was lost. I don't know if there are open positions. I know that there are three people in the AOE that work on CTE and they do all sorts of, they do the compliance work. They, they are overwhelmed with the Perkins and other grants that we need to put in and then they need to review. And so there's a ton of things, data um, collection and review that they do that is really hard for three people to do for all of our CTEs across the state. Thank you. Yeah, I don't know if there are openings or if, if it's always been just three people. Okay. My sense is there were more at some point. Great. Okay, so back to the funding piece, we can do, you know, we can explore that first piece. Adequate funding to meet demand for programming. Um, tell us a little bit about that. So for my personal situation, I don't have enough space to expand any of my current programming or build in new programming where I am. So I, if I'm to expand and, and I can tell you that, and I probably did tell you, welding is an area that there is a need for. And certainly there are plenty of industries in local central Vermont that would support us in doing so. I have two companies talking with me right now, trying to figure out how we can get this started. And it's hard to find a space. I can't, I can't accommodate a welding lab in my building that I'm in currently. And so then you have to look elsewhere or look at expanding or renovating schools across the state to get what you need. And all of our schools across the state, whether they're CTE or not, have some issues and many of them were built a long time ago. And so looking at ways to make sure that we can fund what students need across the state to make sure that it's adequate for their schooling. Okay. The um, baseline statewide CTE educator contract is a little bit about um, making sure that everyone is recognized for their skills. Right now, a lot of teacher contracts are because our CTEs are usually located within um, a bigger district, the majority of teachers in that district are teaching academics and teaching in a regular 
um, educational setting with a, a different schedule. And they have certain requirements like a bachelor's or a master's in training and teaching. Our industry professionals who come into CTE don't necessarily have a bachelor's or master's, some of them do. And they definitely don't have the training in teaching. And so while they're a first year teacher, they're also doing the apprenticeship program currently through VTC. And so they're taking classes to learn how to be a teacher while they're also in the classroom working with kids, trying to teach them the skills of their industry. And these tradespeople could be um, journeymen, they could be masters, master electricians, master plumbers, master carpenters, and they're not necessarily getting recognized across the state in the same way that their peers are because they don't have that bachelor's degree. And I think that that makes it hard for us to hire some folks. It's already a pretty big pay cut coming from industry and plumbing or electrician and into teaching and then to not be recognized for the work that you've done and the years of training that you've gone through in the same way can be difficult. Um, so looking at a way to standardize that. Yeah, there's a discrepancy between how you want to say academic, traditional academic teachers are treated compared to our CTE educated teachers. And I think that a, a few of our districts across the state have work to remedy that in some way or another. If there was a statewide CTE contract, that might help um, make that easier for everyone. Okay. Thank you. Okay. I think uh, we were talking earlier this week about the access piece. Um, I saw, or maybe it was last week, I saw on the 31st, some of that. And so I included in that a link to the state board rules which is not what's in the green law book that you were um, referencing that day, but it's some additional rules from the State Board of Education that CTEs have to follow. And that's where you find the information about um, what grade a student might be in um, ninth and 10th grade and whether they're entitled to technical education. Um, okay, we can, we can have the State Board and Beth in to talk to us a little bit about that. Um, okay, great, establish a baseline. If we had a state calendar for all our schools, we would be so much better off. I know that's been something that people have been trying to do for years. And, mm -hmm. and the reason it would most help the CTEs is that right now, um, when our teachers go to work with someone who teaches similar programming, they have to go outside of our center to another center. And they have to, those teachers need to be able to have time to come together and work together to build their programs. We do mm -hmm. have aligned proficiencies and they need to start working on those rubrics and scales. And so we're right now allowing them to leave and, and go do that professional development because it's really important on days when we have students in the building. And so we're having to find subs for that. So if we had that statewide calendar and we had the same professional development days across the state, it would be much easier for our teachers in CTE to get together and, and be able to collaborate and build our programs even better. Yeah, you know, I've been around the building for a while now, you know, this, this statewide calendar pops up here and there. And I, and I understand it if I were a parent, Sally's off one week, Johnny's off the other week. It's it's doesn't seem to make sense, and but the opposition to it is always huge. And I, off the top of my head, I don't recall uh, where the opposition comes from, or if it's just settling on what those weeks, the the, the, the good weeks are, in addition to the good weeks. Yeah, the good I think some of it's that, and sometimes they. There's this fear that too many people will be on the ski slopes if we're all off. We're all off. You're actually right. The ski industry does, they, they do come in and they, they do express a concern about this, yeah. Um, yeah. The other piece okay. is that some schools go 180 days and some uh, 175. And, and I think that could be accommodated on either end of the schedule as long as there was a baseline. No, no problem. You sure you're okay? Got to continue? Take your time.
I just want to say the salad is really good. Looks good. The salad yeah, part. Yeah. Yeah. I'm gonna... <laughs> Sorry about that. No yeah. problem. No problem. So uh, we're on students under 18 be allowed to job shadow. Yeah, and, and that d does happen in a lot of places, but specifically not in the manufacturing and healthcare industries. And my understanding in healthcare is that students under 18 can't do lift training, but they can be certified as EMTs. And so we want them to be able to do that work. And right now that they're not allowed in Vermont. Okay. Adele, uh, check it. Um, I think what Rob and William were able to talk about was the fact that most centers do not have a full-time adult tech ed assistant director. And that's true of my center. <laughs> it's a part-time addition with a stipend for my, uh, the person that does it at my center. So what Stafford and Southwest are able to do with a full-time person is a lot, a lot better and a lot more helpful for adults around there than what I can offer. Um, so they have a, a range, a full range of programming and it's quite amazing and probably very beneficial to a lot more folks that we might want to see out in the workforce that aren't there right now um, and providing the training they need. So helping to assist and fully fund that so that everyone can have a full-time would be a great opportunity. And I'll read the next one. Uh, <clears throat> allow use of Act 77 funds for high school students to enroll in adult technical education programs to earn an IRC. Um, right now we can use our um, flexible pathways money to allow students to take um, the credits that the fast forward credits that they can get in program, but we can't facilitate them also taking one of the adult options. So I have kids in medical professions who are doing um, CCMA and phlebotomy and those are already really good and they wouldn't necessarily need LNA, but I do have an LNA option at night available to them. They could also choose to take that um, and it would help us. So we don't always fill them. So sometimes we're running them at a, at a cost to us. Um, my last course had only two students in it for the LNA program at night and we could fill it with a few more folks that might be interested and get a few more skills into our students before they graduate but we can't use those funds right now. Uh, IRC, that's the uh, certificate program? It's or? an industry recognized credential. So it's the certificate, yes. And then AO, AOE staffing, you've talked a little bit about, and this committee has raised the question around AOS, AOE staffing in general and whether or not uh, there is any reason to mandate some kind of audit, looking at the agency as a whole. I think Secretary French would respond and say, hey, we, we're, we're nimble. We want to be responsive to the needs of the legislature and what the legislature passes each year. I, I, I tend to agree with him on that also, but there could be a happy medium uh, on some of, you know, <clears throat> allow them to still be flexible to make certain that concerns out there uh, around lack of positions that those those positions are, are, are filled, so. I think the folks at the AOE are working really hard and they're trying the best yeah. they can. And I sometimes get Sunday emails from uh, one of the tech ed related folks. So I know they're working around the clock and it, it just, yeah. it would be really hard to be nimble if you're overwhelmed and overworked. Committee, does anybody have any uh, concerns about us as a committee doing a committee bill relating to CTEs incorporating these issues just to get it in the calendar and then back to us so we can, and of course, we take a time more testimony on it. Sound okay? Mm -hmm. All right, so I'll work with you. Yeah, this has been very helpful. I mean, you really did uh, great work. 
organizing this. I appreciate it. And I also recognize you did it out of your normal work day in addition to your normal work day. Uh, so thank you very much. This really provides us with a great guideline on how to be helpful. Well, thank you for, for listening to us and, and allowing us to participate and for asking for that feedback. Jody, I also wanted to say thank you. And also what I love about these um, are, is that they so directly correlate to job growth in the state. You can almost, it almost jumps off the page. So much appreciated. Thank you, good luck. I mean, you've really actually, I mean, you've really saved the state a ton of time. I mean, this kind of stuff is usually done around a summer committee and there might be some summer conversations, but again, thank you very, very much. And we hope you feel better soon. Thank you. Okay, bye-bye. Uh, Hayden, would you email this testimony? I, I know Beth St. James is here, but would you email it to her so she has it and I'll have a conversation with her about building a committee bill out of <clears throat> that testimony. That was really, really, very helpful. Brian, I'm gonna have to step out. Yeah, for yeah, I got your message, thank you. Good luck. Yep. Ms. St. James, <clears throat> you'd be so kind as to join us at the table. And I do, I have I can access the testimony of your last witness on your website, so. Okay. So Great, thank you. So uh, again, understandably, the agency canceled uh, on a couple of topics we were going to talk about given this situation out there. Uh, we are around school threats. We are going to be interrupted probably about 2.30 uh, by Ted. You may still be with us. Uh, and I apologize uh, for that ahead of time to give us an update on, on things that they're learning. In the meantime, it seems like it would, would be worthwhile for us to talk just openly, have a good conversation around building this miscellaneous education bill. I have been throwing topics out to not only the committee, but to you, and I realize this is gonna take a little time to build. So I thought we could take just this half hour and uh, put a little more meat on the bone, if you will. So, and this, and I look for everybody to, of course, weigh in on this. Um, with regard, the one thing we had talked about was CTEs, you know, open up and op, opening up opportunities for 9 through 12. We would put that into a CTE bill, not a miscellaneous education bill. That was one conversation that I initially thought we would put into this. Um, let's see. Um, there is, there was an issue raised from the Northeast Kingdom around pre-K choice and allowing, as I understand, I don't know if you had an opportunity to hear this testimony. I'm not. Uh, allowing a district to be able to go over the border for pre-K, uh, and I think the reason they can't do it right now is it's New Hampshire, pre-K dollars can stay in, but can, would we be able to allow people to go over with that? with those dollars and use those dollars in circumstances. In this particular circumstance, it was a quicker drive, much quicker drive mm -hmm. than I think a, about a 40 minute mm -hmm. drive. And I'm happy to get that testimony to you, uh, or pick it up. I don't know if you want to watch it or whatever's easier. Sure, I think, um, I, think I, know, um, I think I know how to find it. Oh. And I maybe this question was answered in there, but if this is a question of DCF regulations related to private um, private the pre qualified private kindergarten or uh, pre kindergarten providers, um, it would be a DCF. I was I, I'm not sure that it would be uh, yeah it would be a DCF question. I don't yeah. know the. Stash? I think you're absolutely right. Okay. Uh, just my hearing you say that makes me think that could end up in health and welfare. Perhaps. I think we still draft it, take a look at it, and either punt it to them or I'll talk to Senator Lyons and see if she wants us to kind of tee it up to see if it makes any sense. But you're, I think you're absolutely right. If we were to include that, it would indeed have to go uh, to them. So why don't I watch that testimony, and then okay. if I have any further questions, I will connect with you, uh, Senator Campion. Does sure. that sound right? Sure. Okay. I don't think that the pre-kindergarten 
statute places any specific geographic constraints. Okay. Um, and I don't know what the DCF rules look like. Okay. Um, <coughs> anybody always feel free to jump in at any time. I'll just keep going down my the list I've been keeping. We have not spoken to the agency about this yet, but I am interested, uh, and we'll talk to the chair of appropriations and hope to get the rest of the committee interested in considering an appropriation that would allow for schools I wouldn't even say they're always rural schools, but schools that are short teachers, some kind of access to funds so they can get remote teachers sometimes to zoom in and teach a class. And it's just kind of formulating in my head and it would be connect. I, I worry about, again, the school that kids need that third year of math and right now in these circumstances, they do not have a teacher in that district, nor can they find somebody, but they can find somebody who happens to live in Rutland to teach trigonometry and giving schools some extra funds to help to, to pay for that teacher and to pay for any kind of technological needs, I would uh, like to be able to give that to our schools. So you're thinking like a grant program? A grant okay. program. A grant program. Administered by AOE? Administered by AOE. Um, I don't know the wording for this, and I'm going to look to others to be helpful here. Nobody has come in yet, and I know we need to take a lot more testimony, and set, has told me that proficiency-based learning is the future. Every parent I run into is saying it doesn't seem to be working for their kids. We had some teachers come in and say it's not working for their, you know, in terms of teaching. I think we've got to put it on the table and at least dig in a little bit more and have some kind of conversation or analysis when we're not in the building around whether or not this makes sense. Um, and that's the only thing I would say. If anybody else wants to weigh in on this, just to ask the question, are we, are we going down this path and for me, are, are, are we not preparing kids adequately? The Etra story is the one I heard most recently Two years in French, proficiency-based learning. Kid doesn't know what extra is the verb to be. You know. So again, these are all anecdotal. Hearing different things. We also heard from some teachers. Do we put a pause on this? I think it's worth looking at. So a study, a study committee. Study committee. Uh, legislative study committee. A field study I think committee. I think it would have to be people from the field. And really analyze this. And this is helpful for new senators as well to understand how we put together study committees. You'll hear from a lot of people, uh, study committee, sometimes I think that can be really useful. You know, do we want to spend the next few months pulling apart proficiency education, or do we want to put together a study committee of either legislators or people in the field or a combination of both to look at an issue and then report back their findings? And oftentimes, when it's a legislative committee, the speaker gets to appoint a number of people, the pro tem gets to appoint people, the governor gets to appoint people. In this case, I think the expertise lies outside of the field, outside of the legislature, in my opinion, unless somebody, unless Senator Bulick or a former teacher would want to be on it, it would be um, somebody from the principals' association, somebody from the uh, Superintendents Association. We, we can talk about what that committee makeup would look like, but that's usually how it's it's done. Questions, please. I have a question, and I have a feeling I should know the answer to it, and so I'm a little embarrassed to ask it, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Is proficiency-based grading something that um, was born of statute or? It's a great question. We've been talking about this. Yeah. <laughs> it's a great question. Where was it? Where does it come from? No. So, um, at the uh, the requirement that uh, graduation standards um, and the standards set by the State Board of Education are measured in a proficiency-based learning system is through the State Board of Education rules. 
and their education quality standards. Right. Um, those rules were updated in 2014, I believe, 2013 or 2014, with the require with that those requirements going into effect for students in seventh grade in 2014, with the thought that it would be grad. Uh, the graduating class of 2020 that would have um, the experience in proficiency-based learning. Um, I have been unable to trace back that um, <clears throat> genesis to specific statutory um, uh, direction. I think you heard testimony last week from a witness who described it as um, the field refers to it as common law um, and based on my research and listening to your witness, you know, the legislature has delegated authority to the State Board of Education to develop the education quality standards. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's what they did. And they chose to go with proficiency-based learning. Um, you will often see mention of proficiency-based learning tied back to Act 77, which was the Flexible Pathways Act. Um, but there was no statutory requirement that um, proficiency-based learning become a part of the education quality standards out of Act 77. Um, so to really understand the genesis of that, I think you would need to hear from the State Board of Education of how those rules developed. Um, but no, it's not in statute. It's the statute is the delegation of the authority to the State Board of Education to develop education quality standards. Um, so Hayden, we'll have them in the next week, the State Board of Education, to really help us understand where these proficiency-based yeah. learning standards all came from. So it sounds, correct me if I'm wrong, somebody on the State Board could have said, this is the way we should go. We should go. All in favor, say aye. And that kind of got the ball rolling. I mean, I'm not saying they, they didn't get thought to it or look at a bunch of data. In the universe of possibilities, that is There's always certainly things. a possibility. Okay. But from my perspective as legislative counsel, um, I've been unable to trace it back to a specific legislative directive to um, require proficiency based learning graduation requirements. Uh, th that could have happened in committee discussion as part of um, um, legislative intent that did not make its way into legislation. Mm -hmm. I mean, this happened in 2013, 2014, um, but uh, unable to trace it back. And you heard from a witness who I think said the field considers this the development of common law. Okay. Um, yeah. Can't It'd also be interesting to have the state board weigh in on if they're still steadfast in their support around proficiency or if they change their, yeah. yeah. Just be interested to know. Yeah, so uh, we'll have the chair in. It's a great question and see if, you know, yeah, it's interesting how things happen. Okay. Uh, one thing that we talked about, and I looked to the committee whether or not you want to pursue this, we did talk about the idea of, of working with our colleagues on economic development and put aside some money, likely from the Department of Tourism, I think, or somewhere, on marketing our institutions of higher education. I don't know if that's something people want to explore, but basically it's come one, you know, put some dollars behind. We've got all these institutions. It's a great place to be educated. Um, Part of Vermont branding. Part of Vermont branding, the education state. And we will, uh, it would be an appropriation, and we will, uh, I don't know what that dollar amount would be, but you would put it in there, and then we can have that conversation. Yeah. Can, can we schedule at some point, not, not critically, but uh, an overview of well, what is at a high level? What is Vermont branding? Yeah. You know, I'm sure the Economic Development uh, Committee uh, you know, has had access to a uh, slew of initiatives. I'd just be curious in yeah. like a 20, 30 minute yeah. overview, and maybe there already is a bit, uh, you know, a subsection of education. Yeah. Exactly. It's a great question. Hayden, you and I can talk about that. What is Vermont branding? 
it comes up in ag, as you can imagine. Uh, we had a whole day yesterday on maple syrup. And what happens if all of a sudden our maple syrup industry, you know, were to go down? I mean, it's a huge industry. It's incredible stuff. Um, and uh, yeah, pick up any tour guy from another country, look under Vermont, talking about maple syrup. Great if they also talked about, you know, educate the institutions of higher ed. And so yeah, it'd be good to have, uh, we can have the department in and maybe even have Betsy, uh, she's great, she does the national chamber, the statewide chamber, Betsy Bishop. Bishop. Maybe we even have the Betsy Bishop in. Great job. Um, <laughs> Where did they get that? And uh, talk about this. Great. So just a standalone appropriation, yep. not tied to anything? To programs uh, or to, anything? Well, we will just say now the marketing higher education. Who would the appropriation be to? Oh, the agency of uh, tourism and marketing. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Senator Hashim has on the list making, I think, recategorizing libraries as school zones, which um, I know he is going to talk to the chair of judiciary about. If we were to do something on this, it would likely go down there, I think. But he's heard from constituents that uh, a lot of teaching goes on in libraries. Can we recategorize them as school zones? Public libraries, right? Public libraries, yeah. yeah. Um, libraries are not within my portfolio, so I will partner with, I think it's Tucker Anderson, on this. And, um, well, just following up on that public and I'm thinking, so I don't know much about libraries. So in Bennington, we have the McCullough Library, which I always think of as a private library, I guess. <laughs> but then we have the Bennington Free Library. I think that's also private. So I'm not sure. I would say all libraries, I think. I don't know. Is there a Burlington Free Library that the town or the city supports entirely? The, library. the, the yeah. State Department of Libraries. There's that. that if, like, the town of Holmby has the town funds and maintains the building and everything for, but they're also a part of the Vermont Department of Libraries, so. Okay. Might be some connected tissue there. Yep, yep, yep. Why don't we start broad, then yep. <clears throat> with legislative council or others who understand the subject matter if we need mm -hmm. to Tighten contract. Sounds good. Well, I, the only reason I was asking was because when, as Senator Bashim was speaking, I was thinking of school libraries, and then I was confused because I was like, they already are part of the school. Oh, but, right. Oh, I yeah, see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's why I was So he's thinking of community libraries yeah. and others. So this, this may make more sense to my colleague who okay. works in, uh, or who has more experience in the subject matter, but... Um, who is that? I believe it's Tucker Anderson. I'm not... Okay. Um, positive, but I believe it's Tucker, who does uh, most of the municipal law um, issues. Um, Recategorize it as a school zone. I don't know, I don't think I understand what that means. For what purpose? Oh, he's okay. concerned about uh, firearms. Oh, okay. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, I apologize. There we go. Now we're talking about the judiciary right. teams. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So Not I will used. I will put my head together with my colleagues, Thank and you. some language will come to you. The other thing I have on my list, uh, we've heard from the state board of education. They they make six bucks an hour. Um, they don't have a lot of legal support. According to Dan French, I believe he said that we've never looked at, and they're also seem to be doing a lot of work. Uh, I, I don't know if there's anything to do there right now, but if you could just keep a note somewhere, put it on a draft bill, should we have some kind of examination of staffing and compensation for the State Board of Education? It's a heavy lift, but I know all boards are heavy lift, or not all, you know, some boards are less of a lift. This is a, they tend to do a lot of stuff. We're asking them to do, you know, a lot of rulemaking. And what does that look like compared to everybody else that does this work for us? 
do you want just a placeholder now or if you're thinking a study or an examination of that why don't you quit study or examination we can always yank it during who would be doing the study is it something that jfo would contract out for aoe would contract out for is there a group jfo would do the analysis i would ask jfo to do the analysis okay. and compare it to our other boards and commissions Anybody have anything else for a miscellaneous education bill? Uh, please, Senator Buick. What about that farm to school issue that you and I briefly talked about, that the smaller schools aren't being able to access monies Local. for farm to school? So they're coming in today. Oh, okay. And I heard from some of them in ag. We can ask them directly. Okay whether or not some small schools are, we put $500,000 in the budget last year, and they came in asking for the same amount this year to make sure local schools could buy local produce, right? Yeah. And you heard that small schools are not as able to access that. So that's something we can find out today. <clears throat> Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And then we could can go from there. Anybody have anything else for a miscellaneous education bill at this point? Um, okay. Um, I think that is it at this point. What is your timeline? Well, uh, <clears throat> I suspect you're swamped. Uh, so why don't we get it when we get it? And then we will put it in. And um, when do you think we could get it? Maybe that's the best. We, um, living within reason of people, you know, you're not. Depending on when I get it back from editing, um, my goal would be for very early, you know, aiming for Tuesday. But that, I don't know that I'll get it back from editing by then. So maybe we'll have, we'll have a walk through next Friday. Oh, sure. Does that work? Walk through next Friday. Yes, Senator Pugh. Thank you, Chair. Um, I also have, and you, maybe you're working on this, bit, but there was a bill that I had asked for around signatures on ballots for school boards. Yes, that is assigned to me. So, I don't know, would that be something that would get enveloped into this bill potentially, or should it stay separate? That's a policy decision for you it's, all. It's really up where you would like to put it, but I do think that bill would, if you put it in by itself, it would go to GovOps. Oh, okay, yeah. I think true. because yeah. it's it's the voting. It's true, yeah. What I wouldn't want to do is um, put something in this bill that forces it to go to GovOps. Right, right. So maybe just leave it separate. If you're, yeah. Okay. We could do a completely separate bill. Yeah. I mean, don't get me wrong, I'd love to do the work, uh, work of another committee. No, I mean, you know, I don't yeah, mind yeah, yeah. messing yeah. around. It's uh, about Chapter 11, Senator Campion. What is, is Chapter 11? Do you remember last year? That's under Chapter 11? <laughs> yes. So it would be here. Maybe. 300 page rewrite of Chapter 11 happened. Oof. Did you guys see me before? I was great. <laughs> <laughs> um, I can work with Senator Gulick on. Do you mind? That mm -hmm. would be great. And then I'm happy to take it up here. And then we could. The other thing while we have you is Senator Gulick, Gulick has a school construction language that I think, well, I, sure. I know, I'm looking to Senator. Uh, Becky Wasserman's working oh. on that. She thinks it might be done tomorrow. Okay. Yeah. And so I have asked Hayden to put you on the calendar for next week. Okay, great. Just to give us an overview. Check your email. Yeah. Okay, great. Just to kind of give us an overview of, of the language. Anything else? Okay. So. Hey, thanks for everything. Of course. Um, so am I awaiting instruction? We're going to connect on the CTE testimony you just heard. So if you could take a look at that, mm -hmm. which I think to me, uh, it would be great to build a CTE bill out of this, this testimony. I think they did a great job. But what you and I can do is, after you've had a chance to look at it, maybe tomorrow or Friday, afternoon 
after I think we're done at three, I'd be happy to stick around and just chat about the CTE sure. stuff and see if you have any questions so we can build that bill together and make sure everybody wants to move forward with it. Yeah. So I was wondering about that one piece that was around building expansions, if that would come under school the school construction bill maybe. That would be school construction. Yeah. The other piece I would say may not be jurisdictionally is not necessarily for me to comment on, but um, uh, related to the healthcare and manufacturing fields, those uh, if there are lowering the ages, yeah, if there are um, industry <clears throat> standards or um, laws that govern those uh, limits on uh, age, um, I'm not sure I'm the right one to delve into that, mm -hmm. um, but we can certainly talk about okay. how to figure that out <clears throat> and where to get that information. But that's definitely not a school. I'm not a, not a Title 16 mm -hmm. uh, Yeah, so concept. anything you feel comfort, you have our permission to pull whatever you think needs to be out of a CTE-related bill. We want to make sure it's all germane. <clears throat> Well, I think the strat CTE is going to straddle several areas depending mm -hmm. on what you're doing. Mm -hmm. um, so it's totally appropriate, in my opinion, for me to work on a large CTE bill. Right. Um, but I'm not going to be able to provide much guidance on um, whether um, a healthcare employer sure. should or shouldn't allow an 18 year old to shadow or yeah. participate yeah. in. And we would take testimony and I talked to. Most of this committee is on health and welfare, so we can work together with that. Um, um, I think I might be, give another one. I might be thinking one other thing that someone brought up to me. Um, in schools, apparently there are there's a position, and I if there's an acronym, BC something, it's behavioral specialists. And apparently they don't fall under a teacher's contract. And they were, but they're ending up doing quite a bit of teaching because of the lack of staffing. Mm -hmm. So I was asked to maybe bring that forward as something that could maybe happen. Collective bargaining is usually handled by Damian Leonard. Okay. Um, you're hitting on all the things I don't, don't, <laughs> not in my portfolio. So it's a great day for me. Okay. Um, uh, but you can submit a drafting request to anyone, including me. Yeah, and then you'll. And then okay. my director will make sure it gets to the right person. Um, but historically, Damien has handled all of the labor. He does the labor um, side of, of things. And so um, he usually handles the teacher's contract okay. stuff. Great. But you can send me an email if you want. Okay. Yeah. Is that a question you want us to pull apart a little bit? Can I hear you want to just talk to Damien? Um, makes no difference to me. It would be interesting to hear, because I don't know, it was just brought up to me from someone in a school, and it would be interesting to learn more about yeah. that. You want to have Damien yeah. come in for 15 minutes next week? Yeah, that'd be good. Okay. Anything else? Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Beth. Really of course. appreciate it. <clears throat> I will see you all at we'll some point you. later. Yeah. Great, right. thank you. <laughs> all right, committee, why don't we take 10 minutes before we have uh, Ted Fisher join us at 2.30 for an update on um, general school class. Uh, welcome back to Senate Education, Wednesday, February 8, 2.30. Mr. Fisher, thank you for joining us. Uh, as we mentioned at the start of committee, uh, everyone has received the press release from the agency and uh, knows a little bit about what has happened and what continues to happen. But we are immensely grateful for your willingness to come in and give us uh, an update. So with that, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, for the record, Ted Fisher, Vermont Agency of Education. I'm the agency's director of communications and legislative affairs. Um, so what, what we know, um, I should just note up front, my colleague from the governor's office, Dee Barwick, uh, the governor's violence prevention director, may or may not come in and join us. Oh, if that's okay. okay. So I might, if she if she joins us, I might pass the mic to her. Um, so uh, she's trying to wrap up the meeting. Um, so between what we know is that between zero eight thirty and eleven hundred this morning, approximately twenty one Vermont law enforcement agencies received calls 
reporting active shooter situations at local area schools. How many? 21. Thank you. None of these calls were determined to be legitimate. I should actually just note, it was 20 to dispatch centers, and I'll go into that in, in a minute, um, and one to a town hall. Um, and that is in a community where there is not a dispatch center located in the community. Um, none of these calls were determined to be legitimate. The characteristics of the calls are similar and appear to be part of a hoax threat scam. It's unknown who the perpetrators are at this point and how exactly the hoax was conducted. The incident is under active investigation. You may hear me say that a couple of times in terms of questions that we can and cannot answer at this point. The calls were received to the main non-emergency line of dispatch centers, not to the 911 line. line. And as I mentioned, one call was re received to a town hall, I, I presume to their, their main number. The governor's office is working with the Agency of Education, the Department of Public Safety, local law enforcement, uh, school districts, and other community partners to respond to this inc incident and to investigate it. Um, the Vermont School Safety Center was immediately in touch with Vermont school leaders um, agency leadership at my agency and at the Department of Public Safety, um, as well as with the governor's office. And we worked quickly to get information out to Vermont schools and to the public about the incident. Hey, we sent a note, uh, notice to superintendents and independent school heads and, and principals as well, excuse me. Um, and um, we, um, the, the Department of Public Safety sent out a, an immediate press release and then we, there was a, a press conference at noon. I'm giving a, a poor and abridged version of that. So I recommend um, at very least watching the um, the sort of briefing portion of it. Commissioner Morrison did a really good job sort of outlining all of all of the facts. Um, and so that, that can be found on the governor's Facebook page if you're interested in referencing it later, later today. Um, so every threat was taken seriously until it was determined to be a hoax. So that means there was a law enforcement response. Um, <laughs> Many students, staff, and families were also made aware of the situation as schools followed their emergency plans. Um, so to that note, incidents like this can cause a lot of disruption and anxiety in our schools, emphasizing the need for a trauma-informed response and for schools to be available to their students, staff, and community. Um, I should just note from AOE's perspective, in some ways, the timing couldn't be worse. As, as you all know, the social, emotional, and mental impacts of the pandemic are still very much being felt. Um, that said, many schools have made big investments in this area over the last few years as part of that. So my hope is that they'll have that capacity and they have some resource resources for speaking with children and families about traumatic events. And we also have some of those resources available at the Vermont School Safety Center website. Just a note for families, I'm, I'm paraphrasing um, Deputy Secretary Boucher here, which is in conversations with students about this, emphasize to the student that they're safe, that everything is all right. Um, if, if help is needed, can ask for it from schools, community members, other, other people that you feel comfortable with. Um, and one thing to important to emphasize is if, if, if parents feel that their student needs to, wants to talk about it, they should have that conversation, even if it's difficult or uncomfortable and not, not try to hold it off or whatever. If a student it wants to talk about it, even if, they, even if it's gonna be difficult or even if they can't express what they're feeling, that, that is helpful. Um, the last thing I'll just say is, um, we're, We're still, still early, early in this incident. incident. Um, we we uh, uh, know from know from experience, from with, other experience states, with other states um, that, this um, that this has happened. That this has happened. That in that this can sometimes, um, occur, over this can sometimes days, occur over a couple of days. We my information, information, my information, all from 11 a.m. All from 11 a.m. To my knowledge, an hour ago, an hour ago, when it came down, um, when it came down to get these updates, um, we we had not received, had not received any more. But it's possible, but it's that, we possible that we could receive some this afternoon or we can receive some more tomorrow. We're all being extra extra vigilant right now. Excuse me. Um, um, we're, we're still, still early in the investigative process, so I'm, I'm sure we'll give you an update in terms of what what is going on. Um, I have, I have a, list a list of schools, of schools as, of as of 11 a.m. If you're interested, I can read, I can read them, but it, I have a few copies as well. I can provide. Yeah, I have a few questions. Um, one was just their uh, just their common denominator between all of these schools. That was the first one. Or was, or was it just seemed kind of random? Kind of and the second one was, did schools actively go into lockdown, or was it determined to be a hoax before they actually did that? Um, I uh, 
if you have. I, I don't know in all cases. I, I know, and I'm trying to keep it to the facts that we as in the state know. Um, I have heard some anecdotes about lockdowns or community notifications in some cases or family notifications in some cases. I, I don't want to say that happened everywhere. We also heard we the media did ask um, about uh, the the whether or not schools were communicated with actively during the response. Remember, this was a call to law enforcement. And we know that that happened in some cases um, by anecdote. We don't know if it happened all the time. And again, this sort of underscores the recommendations that we, we have and through the School Safety Center for schools to build strong relationships with their local law enforcement. So it's very possible they received calls as part of, that's because it's part of their, op their operational plan or whatever. And that's something that we I was asked by your colleagues in the house and, and we'll, we can look into it and to see sort of was that a factor in terms of was there communication before a police car showed up in the parking lot for example um to your other question in terms of common denominator i'm, I'm going to try to paraphrase uh commissioner morrison and say that that's still being investigated mm -hmm. that and and some of the technical aspects of of things um the messages were similar whether it was the same message those kind of things are still are what they're looking into and are we don't have an answer yet for those mm -hmm. things but I imagine, I imagine that we will at some point be able to provide that update so and we, uh, any indications that these threats were occurring uh, simultaneously or near simultaneously in other states surrounding from states? what we know and as of when we asked which was this morning doesn't appear that any other New England states had this okay. uh, the answer as far as the whole country goes is we don't know um, what we do know, and I should note, and I, I didn't mention it earlier, what we do know is that um, this is a national, unfortunately, a national trend. We were made aware through our colleagues in public, in the Department of Public Safety, and with, you know, it's this, as you know well from taking testimony, it's AOE, DPS, and the School Safety Center is sort of the bridge between. We sent out a notification most recently in December about this to superintendents to make them aware that this was, unfortunately, something that happens, and that was as a result of information received by the Vermont Intelligence Center, which is a unit of DPS responsible for information sharing among law enforcement, and they had received notice from other states that this happened. So even if it didn't happen um, uh, simultaneously, we know it's happened in other states, um, to schools and, and, and to other places in the community, frankly. Um, the term that was used earlier that I didn't include in my remarks is swatting. Mm -hmm. um, if you're not familiar with the term, um, it comes from this term SWAT team, like SWAT team. And I, I guess there are people who think it is amusing to call the police and get a, a heavily armed, you know, thus the SWAT team terminology, police response to an unsuspecting person at an unsuspecting address. Apparently this is, I think, originally started as some sort of online joke. I, it's not funny, particularly when it gets used um, among the community um, and as a way to attack uh, to attack schools and attack communities and, and spread fear. Um, but it does appear to be sort of, unfortunately, a trend that we're seeing nationally, um, not just among, among school districts. So that's yeah, has the anybody, have any other states been able, when this happens, to track the, 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 the people, the organization, whatever? I, I don't know the, I don't know the answer to that. It does seem pretty sophisticated. Colonel Birmingham had an, an interesting um, response earlier in the press conference. I think it was about closer to the end, if you're interested in here. I, I'll try my best to paraphrase here. Um, in some cases, these incidents are still under investigation in other states. In some cases, unfortunately, it appears that the actors occur, the actors reside outside the United States and have, I mean, I don't want to speculate about their, I have my own beliefs about what their motives might be to attack communities in the United States, but but it could be any number of people. Um, and those are those would be difficult. I think sometimes they could be difficult to find who it was, you know, due to the, the ability to use um, the internet and technology to to make these kind of calls. There was you some said during their conference, yeah. please go ahead and finish. No, I think you were about to say maybe the same thing I was saying, which is that there potentially there's a regulatory I a regulatory conversation to be had and potentially at the I assume at the federal level. Mm -hmm. about um, whether or not we can receive these, whether these it's right for us to continue to be able to receive these kind of calls that are made through the internet, through um, phone spoofing, whatever. I mean, I, I, don't, I don't know, and I'm not, 
uh, I'm way over my skis here to say whether it was the same as like what you might get from a telemarketer or something, these kind of reported calls. But my understanding is that that kind of technology could be employed in situations like that. And we, we I presume, will wait for the investigation to pan out as to whether or not that was well, the type yeah. of thing used. My comment or question was when the commissioner referred to this as an act of terrorism because you are putting fear Correct. into people and creating uh, disorder. Does that, is that a, a word, is that, that somehow connected to anything in statute or anything that allows all of a sudden the feds to help support these investigations or? That's, that's a good question for DPS and probably, um, probably a good question for, you know, once they're a little further along yeah, in their sure. investigation, but, but, but the commissioner did mention that, um, mm -hmm. I just maybe to go to take one more step back is this is a criminal act. Right. Um, there are and there are terrorism statutes, certainly, that this could potentially fall under. But there, but it's also a crime to make threats of this nature, threats of violence. So so, um, yeah, I, I think I think once we know more, we might we might know whether or not. But certainly, um, certainly, I think the term terror is 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 apt in this case. You know, it's, it creates anxiety and provokes fear among members of the community. And, even when there is no incident, it still has an impact, right? There is no, there's no physical threat. Yeah. It still is a, th it still is a threat that causes, um, causes an impact for families and, and students and staff who are just trying to go to school on a Wednesday. So. Mm -hmm. Other questions for Mr. Fisher? I think it, it, it would be helpful for this committee to stay in touch with the agency on this. We have a school safety bill before us. Are there lessons learned? Are there things that either the commissioner, the chief, the secretary, and if you find out in the, the, the days, that, in the next few days, that would impact this bill and what we decide Absolutely. to move forward with. So um, if we could get uh, Let's say a, a, a regular briefing for the next, uh, you know, the next week. In other words, something. If it makes sense for Friday for you to come in for 20 minutes, that would be great. If not, next week in some kind of deep brief around lessons learned, things that we might take from this, and as we build our school safety. Absolutely, I, I would be happy to come and provide an update. One of the th I didn't say this, but one of the the thoughts for me internally is to keep a fire. Understanding you have a school safety policy work in front of you at the moment was to keep a firewall between that because that this is too important right this is an ur urgent event this requires our full attention Absolutely. um but but i think we can provide both an update and and i think it would be interesting for us to provide you exactly sort of exactly what you're just alluding to which is a how how does this apply from a, to the policy angle that's under consideration um and so i will i will communicate that back i know that secretary french is is anxious to return to speak to you more about policy as well. So we and of course, schedule I should preface those. my comments with in no way should we be taking anybody away from this kind of important work that you're doing. So when it makes sense, when Absolutely. when you feel it's com when, when everybody's comfortable to we, return to the policy. Uh, we can front. certainly give an update, and I and I know that um, it's a team effort. So many folks are working on this right now, and I'm, I'm sure our DPS colleagues will have some information for us in the coming days and weeks um, to share. So I appreciate the committee's time. Anything else? Okay. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, committee. We in any moment, I think, even maybe when Mr. Fisher opens the door, we might have our additional guests out there. Do you want to check? Oh, there's one on Zoom. If you want to let that person in. <clears throat> Welcome back to Senate Education, Wednesday, February 8th, 251. We now have uh, Farm to School Awareness Day. We really welcome and re-welcome. I had the opportunity to see some of your faces this morning when I wasn't sharing. Uh, now it's game time. <laughs> and we're really thrilled that you're here. We have an hour. So about five minutes, about, you know, I'd say roughly each before we have to move on to something else. But Betsy, do you mind joining us and kicking it sure. off? And Absolutely. really glad you're here. And if you could just sort of set the table uh, around, you know, what everybody's going to hear and, and why, that would be great. Okay, great. 
Um, so my name is Betsy Rosenbluth. I'm the project director of Vermont Feed, which is a farm to school partnership of Shelburne Farms, where I am, and NOFA Vermont. And it is farm to school and early childhood awareness day. So we're here to talk about the impact of that um, on our students, on our farmers, on our communities. Um, and thank you for inviting us in. Um, we are asking you to support the Farm to School in Early Childhood program with a level funded base appropriation of $500,000 for fiscal year 2024 and to support the local purchasing incentive program at $500,000 in base funding. So the, the governor's budget does include the Farm to School in Early Childhood grants at $500,000. Um, but we just learned that the Agency of Education budget does, uh, for the governor does not include the local food incentive. So, we so if I may, mm -hmm. while we're on this, uh, new, new group, new senators who weren't here last year, we did put the 500000 in last year, correct? Right. correct? So, and that would allow, as we've talked about in this committee, local schools to purchase local, locally. Right. And you're saying that's not in the budget right now? That, that is not in the governor's In the proposal. governor's recommend. Correct. While we're on this topic, I'm going to look to my left here where Senator mm -hmm. uh, Bulig is, who has, has uh, been asking about small schools in particular mm -hmm. as it relates to accessing local foods. And yeah, I just, I received some correspondence from some folks who were saying that they are in a small, town a small school district and because of their size they are unable to access um, the farm to school program does that make sense to you do you know what district they're in some Wyndham County Wyndham is yeah. it Wyndham school um, could be yeah. yeah, that sounds right. So we, we, I can have my colleague, Kellen, from NOFA Vermont speak. Okay. I know for the very, very small schools, uh -huh. you have to be creative uh -huh. in how that happens. So for many small schools, and uh, several of the speakers today can talk about central kitchens that then send the food out to the various schools. That sometimes happens if it's not happening directly in each school. Sometimes very tiny schools will get it from another district. There's some geography challenges if okay. that's the school, and I know we've been trying to figure it out with them for a while, so okay. we can talk about that. The grants program is open to everyone. The local food incentive is open, but it's for um, uh, school food authorities, supervisory unions. So okay. They, are, they would be part of the larger SU for that program. Okay. Okay. Senator Weeks. For the uninitiated in the yes. group, can you just like 10,000 foot view of what is the program, what's the goal yep. of the program, where, how long has it been in existence, you know, just some baseline. Yep. Let me give you, yeah, let me back up for a few minutes. So, um, so Vermont led the nation back in 2007 when we passed the Rosa McLaughlin Farm to School program, which created the first Farm to School Grants program. And that um, program has issued over 200 grants to K-12 schools and um, early childhood programs. Um, a few years back, we expanded the eligibility beyond schools to include early childhood since 90% of our brains develop by the time we're five years old. And so we know that healthy brain development is essential with good nutrition, that's part of it. Um, and so that is now part of that program. It's administered by the Agency of Agriculture. And Gina is here and she'll talk a little bit more about the impact that she's seen and what's happening with that program. With that then, two years ago, we started a local foods incentive for schools, for K-12 schools, that provides um, an incentive for increasing local purchasing. And so we recognize that the federal reimbursement in the meal program really has not kept pace. And when it comes to 
spending those dollars within Vermont, sometimes it costs a little bit more. So it's not a reimbursement for that, but it's an incentive. And you're going to hear from Harley Sterling today in uh, Wyndham County about how that incentive really catalyzes schools to purchase more local because they get a higher, they get a grant that's bringing money back into their program. So we'll talk about that. Schools spend 20, over $20 million a year buying food. And the goal is to capture more of those dollars into the Vermont economy and spend it with Vermont producers and Vermont farmers. Um, so even, you know, 20% of that would be significant. Over 100 farms now across the state sell at least something to schools or early childhood programs. And so we have a nice map on the website we can um, share with staff so you can see all across the state farms have those relationships. And then the third leg of the stool, so to speak, is universal meals. Um, and that component is ensuring equitable access to all these farm fresh school meals for every student in every zip code um, across the state. And so we know with, for, stu for many students, half their calories and half of their nutrition is coming from school meals. And so making sure that that's available and um, all students can enjoy that. And, um, Hunger Free Vermont can share also a lot of information about the impact that just the last three years have had on that. Um, we, I might just jump to this, these three programs then all work together. So this was attached with my testimony and should be in your, um, on your website. But there's a hard copy that just shows how Farm to School and Universal Meals are increasing participation in the school meal program which is bringing more dollars, more revenue into those school nutrition programs, which means they have more money to buy local, which is getting more fresh, um, you know, and excitement from students who are connected to it with the education, then they're participating in the program, and it's this positive reinforcing cycle that, um, that we call the virtuous cycle of farm to school. So that, graphic is just showing you how these three programs are working together in a positive way. Um, and, you know, for us, it's really connecting students to what that food does for their health and their bodies and their communities and the economy. So it's benefiting the students, building healthy habits and connections to food, but also while also benefiting our farmers. It's the win-win of farm to school. And I would share just a very brief story I told this morning of talking to the Sodexo staff up at UVM um, a while ago, and they shared a story with me that they're seeing Vermont kids growing up with farm to school in Vermont schools. When they get to UVM, they're asking for where's the local food, where's the fresh food. And so we know that it's staying with those students. Mm -hmm. I could even say at Bennington College, you know, kids that come from interstate, but even out, I mean, it's, it's, young people are looking for it yeah. more and more at institutions of higher education. For yeah. Sure. yeah, yeah, they understand yeah. that, right, yeah. and the connections. Um, yeah, we had two students, high school students, um, just previously in house education, they had to go back to class or they'd be here from Harwood Union High School, but, you know, talking about what it's like to grow up through middle school and high school with farm to school understanding the connections and you know it is with those kids hopefully for life um, so I, I think I'm just going to save time for questions and for our other speakers so we're going to hear from food hub that has um, been working on how can we best deliver and filling gaps in the supply chain to get that local food to schools we're going to hear from um, the Agency of Education and the Agency of Ag, and um, we have a teacher on Zoom. So it might be easiest 
if I, I can announce the next speaker, it's sort of shifting a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Is, we have Dr. Levine on the list, who's yes, a local he's next. celebrity, so yes, we he's would next. love to hear from Dr. Levine if that's possible. Yep. Yeah. I have the school info for you, just if you want it. Um, River Valley Unified School District, which would include Dover and Wardsboro. Okay. Wyndham Central Supervisory Union? Sorry? Wyndham Central Supervisory Union, is that what that is? Um, Wardsboro and Dover. Yeah, Central. which is, I guess, part of the River Valley's Unified School District. Oh, that, okay, that's the school district. Yeah. SU, right? Yep. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, okay. we're familiar with All right. Thanks. Yeah. I'd be happy to speak a little bit more to it later if we have time Great. for a follow-up. Yeah, yeah, and certainly if there's a legislative fix in any way that would help this situation, we're always all ears for that kind of thing. Great. 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 So Dr. Levine is next. Great. Thank you. So he's not, okay, great. Dr. Levine, how are you? I'm great. How are you guys? Good. Good to see you. And uh, with you, uh, I, I can't quite see the name. Uh, Dr. Levine, I could recognize it from anywhere. Uh, but I'm sorry, your name? Aziza? Yeah, she works in Berlin. Okay. okay. And you are not on quite yet. So I think we're, we're going to start with Dr. Levine. Great to see you and uh, looking forward to hearing what you have to say. Thank you, Mark Levine, Commissioner of Health. Uh, I, I would hate that my celebrity status got me the <laughs> first place in line here, but I, I'm happy to uh, pick this off with a few comments uh, that really are focused on some of the things you just heard, uh, because kids' brains are front and foremost for the health department. Um, <clears throat> and really, many issues which you as legislators and policymakers struggle with whether it be educational achievement gaps or deepening disparities, they have their roots in how well a child is nourished and nurtured at the very earliest points in life. So most of my comments will actually be less at the school level and more on the early childhood experiences like childcare and preschool. But clearly science can link children's brain and optimal development to high quality nutrition. As you uh, just heard, the first few years of life are the most critical for a significant proportion of brain development. And a great deal of the brain's ultimate structure and capacity is shaped very, very early in life. And there are basically three factors that influence early brain development. Reduction of what we term toxic stress, which are the things that produce adverse childhood experiences, the presence of strong social supports and secure attachment, and then the third, of course, optimal nutrition. Now, obviously, it goes without saying that children need access to nutritious foods, but that doesn't mean many, many Vermont children are not at risk. Two in five Vermonters experienced food insecurity in 2022, that's 40%. So a family's nutrition insecurity can be directly linked to an ability to have access to nutritious foods for the children. About three quarters of Vermont's children under six live in households where parents are working. This means these children will need high quality childcare during the work week. And of course, if they're going to be uh, benefiting from their childcare program, they're going to need to receive nutritious food during the course of the day. So they will receive lunch and sometimes breakfast every day, which can be really more than half of their total daily calories. So whether we're talking about a child at home or at a childcare or in preschool, it's important that they receive nutritious meals wherever they are. And one of the vehicles for success in that endeavor is farm to early childhood programs. And this of course, not only supports the families and their children, but also Vermont farmers. Now let's start to explore exactly how these early childhood programs can help overall child development. First of all, farm to early childhood programs bring local foods to children 
in child care programs. So some of these children may have their only opportunity to actually taste fresh fruits and vegetables, things that they haven't maybe experienced in their diet to that point. <clears throat> Obviously, that leads to potentially building healthy nutrition habits, as well as learning more about what's uh, grown in their area. We also know that children actually do let their parents know that they've tried new foods. So that can have an impact on the parents' own nutrition and on the parents' uh, buying habits. And they may be more encouraged then to use these types of foods as part of the family's diet. <laughs> Children are also getting nutrition education as part of these programs. So they learn about various fruits and vegetables and where they come from. Many of the programs in childcare actually have gardens that children can help with and then eat from. Children are often involved with age appropriate food preparation tasks. And we know that children that have grown or prepared food are certainly more likely to try those foods. Now, these programs can also, of course, benefit the farm community by providing opportunities for local farms to sell their products locally to these child care programs, building awareness for families that the farms are nearby and can produce, uh, provide produce and other products for their use at home. And just a quick mention of there are funding opportunities available to early childhood programs to help them create robust farm and early childhood programs. So there's the Farm to School and Early Childhood Grant, an 18-month program that provides coaching and action planning funding for program teams to implement farm to early childhood strategies while supporting nutrition, education, and access, family engagement, and community building with local food systems. <clears throat> and then there are CSA grants, Community Supported Agriculture, that provides 80% of the cost of a CSA share to help early childhood programs specifically across, uh, sorry, specifically accessing local foods that are fresh, building community and relationships with the farming community and exposing children, staff, and their families to local foods. So in summary, these programs support the early childhood system by offering access to nutritious foods where children are during their day, supporting high quality childcare, providing nutrition security and access to families, and offering educational opportunities to help shape children's current and future eating habits, and really their preferences over the course of a lifetime, since so much is determined in those critical early childhood years. I'll stop there and uh, see if there's any specific questions or we can move on to some of the other speakers. Any questions for uh, uh, Dr. Levine? Doctor, I think the only thing I would say is if there is a particular piece of research that you think the committee could sh should see uh, around this issue, if you would forward it along to us, that would be great. Uh, we'll be talking to our colleagues. Uh, if we get the Universal, Universal School Meals Bill out, we'll be talking to them about those early years. We'll be sharing numbers around uh, Things related to you know how important it is to have access to uh, you know farm fresh vegetables, etc. So any any particular research would be helpful. Yeah, I I, I will have my uh, administrative assistant forward to you during the course of this meeting a Journal of Pediatrics publication talking about the role of nutrition in brain development, especially Great. in the first three years. Great. Thank you. Great to see you, Dr. Levine. Really appreciate you weighing in on this. No problem. I'll hang out for a short time. Please Thank do. You. Thank you. Uh, Gina. So oh, we, please. Yes. I'm sorry. Yes, we, no. no we problem. had the 
the folks at school, it's a little awkward. Yes. A student had to go, another yes. teacher dropped out. But Aziza Malik. Oh, was, Aziza, terrific. Was, was on. Yep, is she still on? Still there. Yep, she's still Okay. Hi, Aziza. Um, Great to see you. Thank you for joining us. Hi, everyone. You're, you're Great to see you. Thanks for having me. Um, my name is Aziza Malik, and I'm a fifth grade teacher at Champlain Elementary in Burlington. Um, so I have, I wrote down some stuff, so I'm going to read this to you today. Um, I am speaking to you today to ask for you to support the Farm to School and Early Childhood Program with a level funded base appropriation of $500,000 for fiscal year 2024 and to support the Local Purchasing Initiative Incentive Program for schools at $500,000 in base funding. Uh, I believe in the farm to school early childhood programs um, as being a critical connector, bringing farmers and educators together so that children and youth can experience local food, have nutritious meals, and learn about where their food comes from. When I first started at Champlain, um, which was about 13 years ago, our gardens were in disrepair. There was no connection between our gardens and the cafeteria, classroom, or the community. Students' access to garden programming was limited to whether or not their classroom teacher was willing and able to take on a garden plot. Many classroom teachers were interested in incorporating garden-based learning into their curriculum, but were simply overwhelmed by the task in the absence of systems to support it. Those who were dedicated would lug in things from home like food processors, cutting boards, extra shovels, rakes, We'd spend our own money out of pocket to purchase supplemental ingredients, and all of our planning was done in isolation and outside of the regular workday. Fast forward a couple of years, we had an amazing opportunity come up with the Northeast Farm to School Institute. This transformational program is made possible, made possible through this funding and allowed us to bring stakeholders together from the classroom, cafeteria, and community to create those systems that we were really desperately in need of. We were able to create an action plan and formed a farm to school committee with the objective of connecting those three things, the classroom, community, um, and cafeteria. Uh, now we have the time, money, and expert adv advice necessary to develop a curriculum that includes reading, writing, math, history, science, and to bring the learning and products from the outside into the school. Every single classroom now uses the garden for hands-on learning. So we went from just having one or two teachers bringing all these things in, doing things in isolation, to now every single classroom, pre-K through fifth grade, is working in the, in the gardens. And this isn't only for our school, but throughout the entire school district, um, which is six elementary schools that we're working with, two middle schools and one high school, all connected together now. Um, here at our school, students are harvesting kale that they bring to the cafeteria to get turned into kale chips that is unserved in the cafeteria. They're eating cherry tomatoes straight off the vine. They're harvesting peppermint tea that we use for um, tea during reading time in our classrooms. Um, and we share it with special guests. Um, our gardens have expanded significantly to include plants that directly connect to our curriculum. Our second grade students recently studied pollinators in a nine week long research period. Uh, we worked with the community to not only create a report, but they designed a pollinator garden to enhance the gardens, to attract pollinators that are beneficial to the garden and vice versa, making it more productive and getting that hands-on learning in a way that you, books are great, but this just adds a whole nother element to it. Um, we also now have a cooking cart that's stocked with supplies, a team that works on lesson plans, and, and a full-time employee who's able to plan and deliver instruction. Um, it's just really, really incredible. Um, you know, just thinking the status of the schools these days and what that means to teachers who are overwhelmed, we're understaffed, to have access to all of this and to get our kids outside and getting learning in this hands-on way is just inc simply incredible. Um, our coordinator works really closely with the school chef to help develop recipes, do taste tests that use the produce directly from the garden. Um, in addition, we've really had a focus on even increasing equity within the garden. We've added crops and rec recipes that really are representative of all students. So we've added, for example, heirloom Abenaki crops. We've also worked closely with um, the Association of Africans Living in Vermont and gotten recipes from our new um, our newest Americans into the garden. Um, so we have those crops here. We've been developing recipes around those as well. Um, we also planted those Abenaki seeds that I was talking about and recently harvested them this last fall to then create a squash soup that then was uh, served to the entire school. 
So just amazing connections, getting that hands-on learning and history, science, all sorts of things, plus learning valuable skills of cooking and gardening at the same time. Um, students and families are invested in our garden. They understand the importance of native plants. They're willing to try new foods. Um, gardening really brings our community together. Um, this funding has been transformational for our school community. I'm just asking that you please support the Farm to School and Early Childhood Program. Um, I couldn't be happier that it's around and couldn't advocate it for it more if I tried. <laughs> Love it. So thank you very much and let me know if you have any other questions. Any questions? Please. Hi, Aziza, it's Martine. Hi. I just wanted to say hello and thank you uh, for all you do. You are a fabulous teacher, a rock star educator. And please say hello to all of my friends at Champlain Elementary. I definitely will. Nice to see you. Thanks for your testimony. Aziza, would you say a word or two about universal school meals and how they're going at the school, whether or not it's, yeah. it's working or, or not? If that is actually something that also has been quite transformational because previously it was, you know, kids would get like big bills and some kids wouldn't eat. We all, we have the most amazing school staff that our cafeteria workers would make it work for every kid, but it has just simplified it so much and made it so much more equitable. And I see more and more kids eating the meals and really having the fresh fruit program too. I think that's included in here as well. Getting like a big thing every single day of a fresh fruit from somewhere. Kids are devouring it, eating so much fresh fruit and vegetables. They are fighting over carrots and, you know, like want to eat the last one. And it's just really, really exciting to see that. And I just love the way that it just levels the playing field for everyone. Everyone is eating those meals irregardless of who you are. So that's been a huge game changer. Aziza, I did think of one question. I'm trying to get some other schools and other districts to adopt gardening programs like we have in Burlington because they've got all this wide open land. Um, one of the problems that people always bring up is like, who tends the gardens in the summer? So do you just have yeah. volunteers from the community that do that? We do a combination of things. So we definitely utilize volunteers, but we also have a really strong farm to school program where um, at some of our other schools, so one of the big game changers has been that we've actually had some time to talk as a district. And now we have this full-time employee that works year round. So um, we have a direct connection with our um, food services program. And we have someone who's working on the curriculum and kind of connecting the purchasing and food kind of connecting the three C's that we talked about, the, the cafeteria, classroom, and community together. So um, in the summertime, there's a program, there's Fork in the Road, and so those students are in a work training program where they're gardening, they're learning um, how to prepare food, and they sell it in a food truck. And those students are employed to go from garden to garden and make sure that the maintenance has been done. So we have a partnership with them where they do a good bulk of the weeding and caring for the garden, but we also have uh, community volunteers that come in and water the garden and do other additional supports. Thank you. But that's a huge thing because it is, teachers aren't there in the summer, the students aren't there in the summer. So utilizing it when it's most productive. Um, we've also connected with some of the summer programming as well, like some of the summer camps uh, use it as well. Terrific. Thank you very much. Uh, feel Thank free you. to yeah. Feel free to stick around. Uh, yeah, your, your schedule may have you going off, but if you yeah. if you if you have a few minutes, feel free to stay with us. Thank you yeah, very I'm much. Yeah, I stuck out of a meeting to come, so I better get going. But it okay. was really nice to see you all. Great Thank you very you. much for having me. Okay. Thank you. Ms. Parent. Uh, no background. Gina Clitheroe. Sure. Okay. Uh, oh, there you are. Yeah. Welcome. <laughs> Thanks. Hi. Hi. Gina Clitheroe, Vermont Agency of Agriculture, Farm to Institution Program Manager. I'm here to talk about the grants program, the Farm to School Early Childhood Program that um, multiple folks have mentioned already in testimony, so I'm just here to kind of fill in the details, but I'd like to share um, our fiscal year 2022 report showing the impacts of the most recent round of investments. So, um, as Betsy mentioned, the 
In 2007, this grant program started. Um, we offer, through the Rose McLaughlin Act, um, the Agency of Agriculture offers grants on an annual basis to um, early child care and K through 12 schools through this grant program. Over the last, over the duration of the program so far, over 200 grants have gone out and 1.6 uh, million in state funds have been invested through these grants. And um, as Aziza really clearly laid out with these funds focus across the three C's of farm to school, which is farm to school in the classroom, community, and cafeteria. So within the farm to school grants program, there are three, well, the farm to school program, there are three grants programs within that. The first is the farm to school and early childhood grants program. The second is the CSA grants program, which or community sport and agriculture. And the last is the vision grant. Um, the Farm to School and Early Childhood Grant is the program's flagship funding opportunity. It's been around for a long time, um, and it is a capacity-building grant focused on um, the uh, focused on building sustainable and holistic programs at schools and early care centers. It takes a team-based approach um, to doing so. Um, oftentimes, there's educators, students, um, and and administrators, and farmers, and, and family members all on this on this Farm to School team. And the average award is around $10,000, and that's a package award of financial assistance on average $10,000, and then also robust technical assistance that really helps teams implement that project effectively with expertise from around um, meal program viability, uh, uh, local procurement experts, and uh, school gardens, and also um, in curriculum development. So our partners for that grant program are Northeast Organic Farming Association, uh, so NOFA Vermont, Shelburne Farms, Hunger Free Vermont, and Vermont Garden Network. And then folks also get coaches. So you get a coach to work with you one-on-one -on -one throughout your grant, and you have access to these technical assistance experts, and you have the financial award. And this combination of money, mentorship, and expertise is a proven model to really support the, the development of these programs over time. Um, the second grant program, this one's new, both of the other programs are newer, they started in 2021. The CSA grant or the Community Support or Agriculture grant subsidizes the cost of CSAs or farm shares by 80% for early, child, early childhood education providers and after school programs. Um, this grant is smaller, uh, the average award is only $800, um, but there is a, um, you know, a direct benefit tying both to the farmer and also to the educator and and the students who get to engage with this local food um, and in addition to that you know it's, it's a grant that's really right sized for smaller programs so it's a really unique opportunity and we've seen um, that grant program um, be really highly sought after we had 28 we awarded 28 grants in fiscal year 2022 through that program and um, we've also seen folks start off with the CSA grant and then come back and actually apply for our fiscal year 2023 funds for the Farm to School and Early Childhood Grant Program and be successful in obtaining that. Um, the last grant program is the Vision Grant Program. This program is to support innovative and impactful projects that are um, kind, of, kind of propose outside the box solutions to contemporary problems, whether it's climate change, food insecurity, food sovereignty, racial injustice, um, and these are youth-centered projects, and the idea is that these projects can be replicated and scaled across the state, and that's been a really exciting area of innovation in the program so far. This one also started up in 2021, so we've, we've granted two grants so far through that program, one each year. Um, we granted one this year to, uh, or, sorry, in 2022, to Fairfield Community Association, and there's a little story about them at the back here of the report, on page 11. Um, $16,000. So over the course of fiscal year 2022, the most recent year of the grant program, $190,000 has been invested through these programs and also supporting for the um, farm to, uh, New England Farm to School Institute coaching program, which you'll see here is, is um, was one component of the expenses budget here on page five. Um, but the 
We were really excited that Governor Phil Scott and the Vermont State Legislature increased the program budget for the Farm School Grants Program for last year to 500000 and that's for fiscal year 2023. And we're still working through those funds, so we don't have a full report on how that's all gone out the door just yet. Like I said, we have these three grant programs. One of them opened in the fall, and so we have impacts to share on that one already. Um, We've granted twice the number of Farm to School and Early Childhood grants, that flagship opportunity that we were able to fund last year because of this increase to the base funding. And we are anticipating awarding 60 CSA grants this year in comparison to the 28 that we offered last year. And we are um, allocating $150,000 to the Vision Grant budget, so looking to support several high impact, um, scalable, replicable projects this year in that program as well. So yeah, it's an exciting time for the Farm to School and Early Childhood Program and um, the Agency of Agriculture and the network to see this growth. And I'm excited to share more next session as we get to see the full effect of the $500,000 in the annual budget. Senator Hashim, have you been to Dipperston School? It looks like there are a lot of, that's Wyndham County, correct? I pick up and drop off my daughter there, so yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 It looks like a lot of good <laughs> stuff is happening around local foods there. Uh, yes. Yeah. It's great. Yeah, they received a 2022 um, grant from the Farm to School and Childhood Program. That's great. Yeah. Yeah, terrific. Questions? Senator Williams. So I was a cert no for certified vegetable farmer from 2008 to 12. Wow. And I got out of it because I couldn't make a living at it. So how are, how are we making sure that the farms that want to get involved in this program get the information they need and actually get an equitable share of getting their vegetables to market. Mm -hmm. That was part of the problem with that, because we have such a short growing season, unless you've got plastic, plus you can grow under a greenhouse, that you just, you're competing with everybody else's. Uh, I know in, uh, I don't know if you ever hear of group, the Bear Roots Co-op, mm -hmm. they, they had a program that was excellent, and, and I followed that. Uh, when, I, when I started getting involved with the, uh, actually it was the uh, Master Gardener's course. Vern mm -hmm. Groovinger had a mm -hmm. couple meetings with him. They they made sure that everybody, okay, you're going to be in the co-op, you're going to grow potatoes. Mm -hmm. And that I grow beautiful tomatoes. Well, you know, we want you to grow to potatoes, so, and if we need, somebody has a blight or whatever, your tomatoes, we, we'll, we'll buy your tomatoes too. So I'm just concerned that um, everybody that wants to be involved in it, because if you're talking about taxpayer money, is going to get a, going to get a chance to participate. Um, yeah, that's a great point and a great question and I totally um, It sounds like a lot of money is going to school programs yes. where they actually have their own gardens and, yeah. uh, and I think that's wonderful. Yeah. But if we're also looking at maybe we can make some distribution out to some of the local farmers. Yeah. Well, you know, the CSA grant program, which is this, a smaller grant program, but that funding does directly benefit farms because if they're partnering right. with an early child care provider, the early child care providers, you know, being reimbursed for that cost of signing up for a CSA. Um, but I, I think that some of my other colleagues, I think Becca with the um, Green Mountain Farm to School can really talk a lot about um, the process for onboarding okay. producers and yep. supporting them in accessing institutional markets. Yep. Definitely an important market outlet. Thank you. Yeah. Gina, you're with the agency. I am. Perhaps also just something you'd go back and ask any of your colleagues who might be able to also respond to Senator Williams' mm -hmm. question you know, in an email. What else is out there? to support our farmer. I mean, I know there are a range of grants, but yes. just to give him an idea of what, what's out there, that would be great. Yeah, sure thing, happy happy to do so. We, we certainly have a lot of grants for the agency of Ag, and there's stuff beyond, yeah. too. Yeah. So yeah, happy to reach out. I just looked at your map, and I think my farm is still on there, but I'm not, I'm not no for certain. I didn't know that you had a farm. Yeah. Oh, that's great to know. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Senator Weeks. Uh, so in your in your uh, program overview, you get a couple of um, kind of administrative items um, that were required for program management and such. That's, you know, that's and I'm sh I assume that comes out of the, uh, the the grant money, and that's all that's appropriate. I'd like to kind of flip this around 
180 degrees and take the perspective of the school. What, what, what are the elements in the school itself which require uh, funding um, to, to uh, exercise the program? If you can take that perspective. Not the, not the agency, but coming back from the school, looking mm -hmm. at the agency, how, how are the funds utilized at a local level? So are you asking, I apologize, um, Senator, are you asking what type of, like, how much staff time is needed to manage the grant and apply for the grant? Yeah, I don't want to, I don't want to color it at all, because I don't know what the, co I don't know what the costs are from the school perspective. Right. So there's money being allocated, yeah. some of it's being utilized by the agency to run the program, mm -hmm. so, you know, it's, it's appropriate. But does the school benefit from, do the dollars actually go to the school? And if yes, what in the school are they using the money for on a day-to-day -day basis? Yeah, so the within the 500000 that's allocated for fiscal 2023 and the 190, none of that is going to the Agency of Agriculture um, for administration okay. of that program. Um, the question around the budgets, they vary a lot based on what the project needs are for each school, specifically for that Farm to School of Early Childhood grant that can kind of be a lot of things, but um, sometimes it'll fund, you know, garden equipment or the um, professional development for staff to, to learn about how they can integrate into the curriculum or to pay for subs even so that teachers have the time and space to engage in professional development around farm to school curriculum integration. Um, there's probably some other examples that other folks could, could share, but um, equipment for you know, processing food in the kitchen, um, mobile kitchen projects, I think we had someone testify about that earlier today. Um, so okay. yeah, a wide Good. variety of, of projects can be supported. Okay, that's all, thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Thank you. Thanks so much. Thanks. All right. Yeah. Um, I don't know if Connor's here or Carly wants to jump in. Oh, there's uh, Okay, with the Agency of Education. So the local food initiative is administered through the Agency of Education. Okay. Thank you. Hi there. Um, for the record, my name is Connor Floyd. I'm the grant program manager for the Child Nutrition Programs team at the Agency of Education. And I'll be providing a brief overview of the Local Foods Incentive. Um, this is the second year that the Local Foods Incentive Grant Program uh, has been operating. This is a state-funded uh, grant program with a $500,000 appropriation. And the grant program is split up into two separate tracks uh, to help get schools kind of ready ready for the program. And so when a, um, when a school food authority, which is just a, an organization of schools, usually at the supervisory or school district level, chooses to apply, they're gonna start with a baseline year grant. Um, that baseline year grant is a couple simple questions that's really getting schools thinking about um, what, what they need to do and what they need to prepare for to shift their purchasing and be successful in the grant program. It's really there to be a support. And so every, every application for a baseline year uh, grant that we've received, we will review and maybe provide some feedback, but they've all been approved. Um, and so that gives schools a 15 cents per lunch grant award for that baseline year. And the intention there is for it to be a little bit of some um, seed funding help schools uh, cover that increased cost of purchasing local, which is going to be required to qualify for those subsequent year grants. After a school food authority has successfully applied for a baseline year grant, every following year will be a subsequent year grant. And that's when uh, it's a performance-based award. Uh, schools need to track their local purchasing and we review that documentation. We'll ask for some backup receipts uh, just to confirm that the numbers that they report are accurate. For the subsequent years, there's three award tiers. And so uh, school food authorities must at least hit 15% local purchasing. If they do that, they'll receive 15 cents per lunch served. The next tier is 20%, where they'll get 20 cents per lunch. And then the highest tier is 25% local purchasing, which results in a 25 cents per lunch award. Um, this year to kind of help get the word out and uh, prepare, 
pair of schools for this. Um, we partnered with Vermont Feed and a couple of food service directors to host uh, a webinar training during our summer institute, which is uh, the period in August when we're preparing schools for the coming year. And that training gave an overview of what's going to be required of the grant, uh, provided some context in terms of what, what an audit would look like of their applications. Uh, we don't want any surprises for folks that apply. We want them to be prepared with uh, the documentation that we need to verify those applications. And then we have the food service directors on that call as well to provide some insights into um, their purchasing strategies and just ways for you know, making, stretching their budget and still purchasing local. We also have put out quite a few guidance resources, both through memos and uh, different pages on our website to explain the different aspects of the program. And then finally, in designing all of these, the different pieces that make up the local foods incentive, we work, we work really closely with food service directors, food hubs, nonprofit partners. Uh, we recognize that uh, food service directors are already really stretched thin. And so to add another grant program for some uh, is a really big ask. Inherently in this, in this grant, there's a lot of work between tracking all of those foods separately, um, keeping all those receipts, getting some product documentation uh, that demonstrates that it is indeed Vermont local. Uh, and so we really, beyond the, the core requirements we need to ensure program integrity, we've been really mindful of um, trying to keep things simple. And, you know, we've done that by the application for a subsequent year grant is built right into a financial report that we already have to collect, right? And so instead of needing to submit a whole separate application for a subsequent year grant, there's just a few extra lines in a financial report um, that school food authorities complete. Um, so we're doing things like that to try to really make it as, as low impact as possible. Um, one, one thing that has come up um, quite a bit is thinking about what does local mean, right? And that's a question we often get from school food authorities when they're just beginning um, and is sometimes a point of confusion. And so the, the grant uses the Agency of Agriculture's uh, Vermont local definition, which has three categories of product. And there's pretty specific uh, requirements to meet those local um, criteria. We, we discovered when starting to implement this that there's not an existing list of what counts as local. There's no one uh, checking or approving those. So we were really starting from scratch. Uh, the approach we've taken with the question of what is local and what isn't is we put that on producers. And so Vermont Feed has been really helpful in collecting letters from producers um, verifying that their products are local. Vermont Feed has created an open database for schools. So it's easy to check there. And schools also always have the option to reach directly out to a producer to ask for one of those letters. Once we see that there's that letter verifying that it's local uh, at the Agency of Education, we don't do any more digging there. Um, we take that at face value. So briefly looking at this past year's results of um, the local foods incentive. This was, again, the second year. So it's the first year that there were some school food authorities that could apply for a subsequent year grant. There were 23 that were eligible, which means they applied for a baseline year the previous year. Of those 23, 15 applied. And of those 15, six had local purchasing percentages that were 15% or higher. And so there are six school food authorities that are going to receive a subsequent year grant award, assuming that um, the audits that we're conducting right now all passed and that everything that was reported was accurate there. Uh, the other nine school food authorities, right, they tracked their local, they did everything they needed to, and their numbers just didn't hit that 15% uh, threshold. Uh, but in, in their financial report, they still reported those numbers to us, which we appreciate because it gives us a context of the full picture of what schools are purchasing. Uh, there were eight school food authorities that could have applied for a subsequent year, but didn't. Um, and then there were an additional eight school food authorities that applied for a baseline year. So it's their first year engaging with the grant program. Uh, in total, there was uh, just under $340,000 uh, in funding requested. And so we anticipate to award about that much. That is, um, you know, well below the $500,000 appropriation for the program. Uh, but a 
as Harley can attest to later on, it takes a while to really shift your purchasing. And so the schools that are currently at that 15% or higher, they've likely been doing local purchasing for much longer than this past year, right? That is just the first year that it's being demonstrated through this grant program. As the years continue, we anticipate that uh, funding request to increase as more schools uh, become eligible. And so at this point, despite uh, being a little low right now, I think it's that $500,000 appropriation. It feels like the right fit for the time being. Um, finally, uh, two other things to highlight. One is that 27% was the, the highest local purchasing percentage. And that was uh, Wyndham Northeast's uh, local purchasing percentage. Harley's coming up right after me. Um, and so he can speak more to his efforts. Uh, he can say, you know, he didn't start purchasing local and their program's been doing this for a, for a long time. It didn't just start this year. Uh, so it's been a lot of work that, to get there. And then of the 15 uh, schools that did apply and recorded their uh, local food budgets, that accounts for um, right around $775,000 of Vermont local food purchased. Uh, and so that's just a, a good number to track as, as we go. And as more schools apply and we get more data reported, uh, I'm, I'm sure that number will grow. And so I will leave, uh, leave it there, but I'm happy to answer any questions folks may have. Connor, one of the things that came up this morning in the Ag Committee, and I'd like you and Rosie Kruger to perhaps come back next week and uh, share with the committee, we're, we're not getting the forms through so many families that we need to be to draw down money from the feds for, for universal school meals. And there was talk from the chair of ag and others, can that form become a little livelier? Can we do more outreach? Can it say something at the bottom? Support your local farmer, fill this form out. Something. So I'm going to have Hayden reach out to you uh, and have you come in uh, just maybe next Thursday for a, a little update on that. We would appreciate it. Yeah, that would, um, Rosie's the, my supervisor, Rosie, the, uh, the director is the best fit there. Um, I don't, I don't work on those forms, but she's been, uh, working, uh, really closely on the universal meals, uh, initiative. We're putting it on you now, Connor. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see you next Thursday. If you don't want to do it, you might want to talk to Rosie. <laughs> I'll, 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 I'll check in with her. All right, so, thank uh, you. We'll we really appreciate it. We really appreciate it. Great. Yeah, so we have about 15 minutes, just so you know. We have a hard stop because uh, we have to finish our testimony. Committee members have something at 4.30, so. All right, I'll be Great. as quick as possible. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Senators, Senator Rashim, great to see you. You too. Yeah, I almost didn't recognize you with the suit. I, <laughs> I recognize you with the chef yeah. stuff on. But, yeah. Yeah. Dressed like a grown-up today for the occasion. <laughs> um, so I just want to echo all of the points made in this great testimony earlier. I'm here to ask the committee to support the local purchasing incentive, $500,000 in base funding, um, and the Farm to School grant program, $500,000. I also want to thank um, the legislature for all of the work they've done to support the Universal School Meals Program. Um, I shared testimony in the House Ed Committee uh, last month um, that was um, just really compelling. I reached out to constituents at my schools if they wanted to share any stories um, for me to bring, and the response was overwhelming. And from a very diverse uh, group of stakeholders, from nurses, parents, grandparents, teachers, principals, uh, I made a joke that it's pretty hard to get people in schools to agree on anything. Um, I think we had 23 emails back and forth about when to reschedule school picture day. So, <laughs> so it was a real testament. Um, you don't often see something that everyone uh, thinks is just a win, 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 but universal school meals, and as I'll try to explain, uh, local purchasing of these farm to school programs are as close to, to a win, win as uh, I've ever seen. Um, so I just want to stay in my lane and speak about the local purchasing incentive in schools and what I've seen this year. Um, the grant has been, I hate to use the word game changer, um, but I don't have another one, another term. It has totally changed the landscape um, and the conversations that I'm having with other uh, school food directors across the state. Um, 
they're all really in, engaged with trying to um, make this local thing happen. And as Connor pointed out, they, they didn't give out the full grant this year, but so many people were right on the cusp. And so many people are just getting started, trying to start building these systems, find these recipes. How did you do that? What did you do? Um, we bought a potato peeler in our district um, to start doing more local potatoes, because if you've ever worked with local organic potato seconds, you know they're little green golf balls sometimes. And <laughs> you don't have um, four labor hours to peel potatoes. Things like that are happening all, there's just great stories from around the state. Um, Scott Fay shared from Essex Westford that they bought a um, beef burger patty press and they're making their own beef burgers. Um, so that would represent a very large scale of how to do this. But um, in our very rural, um, small district, you know, we're trying to do it at a, on a smaller scale to show that it can be done in schools with only 70 kids maybe. Um, but that those same systems will scale to our high school that has like 350 represented of a lot of districts in Vermont. Um, so just, I see so much value in this program. Um, we've always heard people message that they buy local and there's always been, what does that mean? Yeah. And so to finally have these data that is like, here's the numbers, here's the receipts. Um, it's been a wake up call for some folks that are realizing, whoa, that's actually kind of hard to buy 15% local, but it's doable. And here's the districts that are doing it and making it happen. How do we get there? How do we get that for our school? How do we get you know this, some of the best food in the world that's grown here in Vermont that goes to all these fancy restaurants? How do we get that same food in the communities where it's grown? Fed to, to you know a, a group of, a group that maybe that's 50% of the calories they're getting that day. I can certainly attest in my district I know that there's kids that that's the only food they're getting that day. Um, that's really been our mission um, before this grant existed, was to try to build these systems out and be a model for other, for other school districts. And this grant has enabled that um, just tenfold. And the, the, the value of the return on that $500,000 grants or $340,000 um, this year, um, as Helen said, over $700,000 in local food was purchased, um, but you know that is only going to grow. And if we had every school district in Vermont at 15 or 20 percent, I mean that's that's a big that's a big number. And um, Senator Williams, to address your question from earlier, having the school, which is probably the largest restaurant in town in most towns, be engaged with um, their local farmers is the best way to ensure that every farmer who has product available can start to build those relationships. I know I hear from people all the time, it's like, I, I, I grow potatoes, I grow maple, I do um, sugaring. Um, we have lots of those direct relationships, but then we also have the food hubs and the, um, you know, the logistics starting to grow around the state to service some of the, the bigger districts as well. Um, so I'm just really enthusiastic about this. I think it's a really great investment and um, I hope that this body will continue to serve. I didn't want to sound selfish, but when I, my farm is still there. I had some health issues, so the farm has been foul. Mm -hmm. uh, I was I had uh, interns from Green Mountain College okay. in Poland yeah, yeah. that were the number one sustainability college, so they went under. Mm -hmm. And uh, the problem was finding finding help because I was a one man operation. And they they provided some pretty good. Help. They uh, they were really interested in growing good quality food, uh, and maybe is there any way that we could extend this program into s students that like to work in the school garden? Maybe extending it during the summer months to help the farmers on the farm. Yeah, we we heard testimony earlier just about how engaging it is to students when they're involved in growing the food if they get to do a school project where they're in the garden and they grow a pepper, um, that's where they're trying things that they maybe had never, they would never try otherwise. Because it's all about stories and, and this gives them a story. It's like, I grew this pepper. Yeah. I, and, and so like in our elementary schools that have these robust farm to school programs, you just see their, their salad bar participation is off the charts. Kids are just throwing stuff on there. And by the time they get through school to sixth grade, you know, they're salad bar experts and they go on to our other schools 
And you can notice a difference from the different schools that feed into our middle and high school. Like if they don't have as much of a farm to school program, you know, some of these kids are experiencing, um, they're starting from a, a later date. So, um, yeah. If we, if we can grow it right here, why should we ship it from 3,000 miles away? Exactly. <laughs> Yeah. So, sorry. No, it's fine. It, it, in addition, uh, in addition to gardening, which I, I get the linkage between the kids and the growing and the food and the habits, and I, I get all that. But I'm going to take a kind of a corporate perspective okay. on, on what you're doing, what everybody's uh, advocating. So, in the corporate world, when we want to change some behaviors, we put that responsibility back on vendors. We require vendors in contract language to change their habits. Okay. So, for example, if in this case, if the goal is to achieve 20% local purchasing, I assume that schools, like a lot of larger institutions, uh, use companies like uh, Cisco and such to, okay. So wouldn't it be a simpler solution to, in the re request for proposal from a food vendor to say, look, you now have a mandate for 20% local production or local, you know, including 20% local food production into our uh, into this uh, business relationship. Yes. Go forth. Yes. Solve it. Come back with you know with how you're going to do this, uh, and and basically just kind of like not make it your responsibility to figure out a new method to source, you know, green beans from Williams Farm or whatever whatever the case might be. You just you, they do it for you, and then and then. Department of Agriculture or aid, uh, Education or, or whomever agency um, that then takes that and they just validate. Okay, it's it's happening that way. I'm just curious why why it's like a 180 degree difference because it's a public institution as opposed to a private institution. What you're saying totally makes sense. And there's a lot of um, people who are involved in this at the state level with the food directors buying group and um, people involved in procurement who are doing this work. And what I would say is that this grant has given schools an incentive to want to buy more local and back it up with documentation. And what that is in turn doing is creating the market pressure on these larger vendors that now we need to find a way to get more local on our trucks so that they can compete with the food hubs or, mm -hmm. or whomever, or even the larger districts who just don't have time to have 37 direct relationships with farmers. I need it to be on my Cisco truck or PFG truck. Um, that is happening. And I just can't emphasize enough that like we are so early in this process, so many good things are just getting started. Um, it is only going to continue, and those those relationships are only going to become more robust. And I, I do see that happening, where more local is going to be offered. It's already happening. Okay, I just want to make one more caveat. Okay. That uh, so in this case, where this is a state-funded, supported initiative. To, to change a behavior, but in the other model, the corporate model, that cost is absorbed by the by the vendor, and it, it's not. It becomes comes from a state perspective, becomes a flat cost. It's not. It's not. It's not a cost that is needed to be absorbed. And I'm just kind of curious why. Well, you're preaching to the choir because we've tried to we've tried to really buy local without even bragging about it. Mm -hmm. um, but what the grant has really done has just changed, like, you know, you can say we buy local. We, we have, we're a Vermont farm to school cafeteria program. And like, you don't have to do very much to, um, to prove that or back that up. And it's very effective, cost effective, to, to kind of local wash and say like, yeah, we do all this great stuff, but to actually purchase local from Vermont farms in a systematic way it just requires all of these different support systems, I think, and um, to get to where you're talking about getting, if that makes sense. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Do you want to do uh, Thank you. Yes. some wrap up? We've got about four more minutes. Sure. So, any concluding comments or new information? Yeah, absolutely. Be great. I know we're really short on time. Um, I'm hoping to clear up some of your questions about how this these programs benefit our farms and small businesses and food producers and some of your questions about how this works within the procurement and the, the supply chain levels. Um, my name is Becca Perrin. I'm the account manager 
for um, Green Mountain Farm Direct. We're a local mission-driven uh, nonprofit food hub, so we're the intermediary between schools that want to purchase local and the local farms. So to speak to your question, Cisco is an enormous corporation that that is its bottom line is fed by sourcing the cheapest product possible and shipping it as far as it needs to go. Um, meanwhile, we are doing the work to create relationships with these local producers and make sure that they're being opened up to these new markets which are being created by grants such as these, which give schools the funds to purchase local. Um, so I'll tell you a little bit about what I do, um, but first I'll ask that you please support the Farm to School and Early Childhood Program with a level funded base appropriation of $500,000. And also please support the Local Purchasing Incentive Program at $500,000 base funding. So we are a aggregation and distribution service and um, we source a wide range of products from over 50 Vermont based producers from fruits and vegetables, dairy, eggs, meat, soy products, beans and flour, maple and honey, pickles and other value added products. And we serve as 72 school accounts across 18 supervisory unions and five private schools and early education centers. Um, we broadly serve northern Vermont, so there are other food hubs that serve the other areas of the whole state is covered by food hubs. Um, not all of them use the food hubs. Um, not all SUs in the state do, but these programs help schools to utilize the services that food hubs provide. Um, in the Northeast Kingdom, where we service, many schools are rural with enrollments under 100 and tiny procurement budgets. So given these barriers, local purchasing is often a challenge, but the local purchasing incentive is a direct response to the challenge. And I included a, an example in my testimony about Caledonia Central Supervisory Union that we saw bounce back from the COVID-19 school year to this past school year. Um, and we saw them bounce back to purchasing uh, local, locally raised ground beef from NEK meat producer Rose Slaughterhouse in Troy, Vermont, um, locally grown, grown and stone ground wheat flour from Morningstar Farms in Glover, and carrots from Pete's Greens in Craftsbury. Um, and all 52 of our Vermont-based farmers and producers were directly benefited by the sales increase that we saw after the local food purchasing incentive was launched. Um, but especially our small-scale vegetable growers like St. Joe's, Joe's Brook Farm in St. Johnsbury, Hartwood Farm in South Albany, and West Farm in Jeffersonville. So we're see seeing real data that supports local, local farms and producers being supported by this incentive program. Just the broad strokes. <laughs> Any questions? Yes. I did have clarity on my earlier question. Um, I guess the issue um, that my constituent is having is around the minimum order size. Yeah, that's a really great question yeah. that comes up, especially with the tinier schools. Yeah, so I guess he was hoping that maybe that could go away so that it could be more equitable to the smaller schools. So right now they can't get the money because they're just so small. Apparently, or they can't get the food. It's like delivery is the issue. Yeah, it's a right. minimum, delivery. minimum delivery amount. And sometimes it's $200, sometimes it's $400, it depends on the distributor. Is there a way to fix that? Because there are a couple yeah. ways around it, yeah. Okay. There, okay. Are, there are drop shipments, so if, if we're talking about an SU that has five, let's say five schools, is, if they sorry, all is pool, it a Yes. Okay. So they can pool their orders, so they can all the schools can go in on one order and then distribute as needed afterwards. Um, there are also ways for them to order up and get foods that will last longer than a week so they can maximize their order that way. Um, depending on the food hub that would service them, there are a couple workarounds. What's the SU again? Windows. Oh yeah, Food Connects would be the yeah, one. Yeah, the River Valley. Yeah. 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 Do, you, do you do anything with uh, the local distribution companies like White River and Black River uh, produce as we don't, far as distribution? Right. We don't work with them. Okay. Um, they, um, as far as I know, they don't do much with schools. They deliver local produce to retailers and, and co-ops. Um, they're a competitor of ours. Um, but again, we are finding a market with these, this local food specifically because we spend so much time creating relationships with producers mm -hmm. and making sure that we're supporting them that way. It almost makes sense that if you went to some kind of a co-op, statewide co-op, to 
find out who had, you know, who was going to grow the vegetables and make a make the, even contract with. Mm -hmm. It might be something to think about with the ag department. Mm -hmm. um, it just made the like the bare roots co-op I talked about in I think it was in Brownville. That was such a concept. It was, it was such a great concept that um, helped the farmers and it made sure people the markets had had fresh local food. Thank you all for joining us. Yep. We very much appreciate it. This was very helpful. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. And we look forward to staying in touch. Thanks so much. Great. Thank Could you. Could you, yes. Senator, give me just one sentence? Yeah, please. Um, just a final plug. Uh, for the record, my name is Helen Bordfett from the Northeast Organic Farming Association. And together with Shelburne Farms, we run the Vermont Meat Project. Um, I'll share my remarks and I can uh, pass them along to the committee assistant, um, or I'll save my remarks. But really, we just want to underscore that we've learned today that the $500,000 appropriation for this uh, really transformative, revolutionary uh, local purchasing incentive program has not been included right. in the governor's budget. So we would really like to reiterate that request that you um, that you support the $500,000 base appropriation for fiscal year 2024. And I believe that's changed since this morning, right? Yes, because this morning I would we were... re reiterate that. I would I would yes. reach out to the chair of yes, agriculture we as well. Thank right. you very much. Great. We'll do that. Yeah, great. Um, we learned that information in our last right in between. Great. Right. Right. Yeah. So, yes. Thank you all very much. Yeah. Thank you so much. Great. Great. Let us know if you have any questions. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Great committee. I think Beth St. James is probably right outside here. We're going to jump into uh, Act 173. See you around.